the uh, college went off on the water. I mean, it's I know like you guys just still get to sit in, but uh, we'd like to get our speaker up right away because we have about a tenth of the cover. Order. My name is Tim. I'd like to welcome all of you to the College of Complexes tonight. The College of Complexes consists of the following format. The first one is our speaker who will speak. The second part will be our question and answer period. And the third part of the night will be your infamous rebuttal period where you get a chance to sound on or off topic about what the speaker said. We have a speaker tonight and uh, his name is Scott Hoffman. He wrote a book called Inside, is an intriguing work detailing the internal workings of the outfit and organized crime family, which originated in the south side of Chicago during Prohibition and rose to power in the 1920s. The outfit has been involved in a wide variety of criminal activities, including gambling, loan sharking, prostitution, drug trafficking, money laundering, extortion, labor, racketeering, adult and child pornography, political corruption, and murder. The individuals and events are inside our composites of real people and real events. So, and I know tonight that uh, Mr. Scott Hoffman is going to be speaking specifically more about the uh, JFK assassination and the connection with the mob. And of course, our favorite president, Mr. Donald J. Trump. So let's welcome, let's all give a, let's all give a rousing round of applause for Mr. Scott Hoffman. If you're ready, come on up and let's get speaking, Mr. Hoffman. Tell us about where to get your book right first thing. So. I'd like to thank uh, College of Complex for having me back a second time. And I'd also like to thank. It's, 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 all, it's, it's okay. great. Yeah, you're I'd like right. to thank uh, Charles Paddock, your program director, who has been very, very helpful in organizing it tonight. Charlie, Charlie, Charlie. <laughs> Charlie. Get it now, as I said, my name is Scott Hoffman, and I've written the book Inside. And Inside is a composite of real people and real events from the outfit. The reason being is I'm an insider's kid. My father yeah. was an underboss for Paul Rica. Oh boy. My father was a consigliere for Sam Giancana. He was a consigliere for Joey Ayupa. Oh. And he reported to Tony Accardo. My oh. father also had the financial plan for Las Vegas. So I'm kind of aware of mob activity and mob life. <laughs> now my book, uh, you can get on Amazon. Uh, if you put in my name, Scott M. Hoffman, and then just put in Inside, you will see it. And also, it is sold at uh, Barnes & Noble. They can get it for you. It's not, they don't have it in-house, but they can order it for you. Now, tonight's program, uh, since everyone is interested in, what's his name, Donald Trump? Is he the <laughs> president? That's it. Okay. I, guess. I will talk about him first. Okay. If, you're, if you're a developer in New York, a commercial developer, there's two things you know. You're going to have to grease someone in New York City government to get your permits and your license. And you're also going to have to deal with mob, various, the, the five mob families who control the unions. Donald Trump's father, Frederick, was not really a commercial real estate developer. He developed middle income housing for Queens and Brooklyn. And he would also develop uh, residential property, or, you know, maybe 15, 20 story buildings where there'd be rental property. Yeah. And he owned a great deal of property in New York that was rental for businesses. But Mr. Trump, and I guess his son Donald le learned from his father, had quite a bit of problems with New York City as far as in his rental properties. Mm. He was very discriminatory. <laughs> And the father, Frederick, if you were Puerto Rican, which is the pre predominant Hispanic group in New York, or if you were black, or if you were Jewish, he would tell you he had no vacancies. <laughs> now, Donald in 1971, before I get into the information to talk about Donald, he had the same problem. Basically, what he would do in his residential property that he had built, if you were black, he gave you a long questionnaire to fill out. He wanted to know if you had any felony arrests. And after you, after you filled out the questionnaire, he would tell you, there's no vacancies. <laughs> now, when he had uh, whites come 
to look at apartments. There was no questionnaires, and there were vacancies. So the city of New York was fighting him. When Donald started, he really was a novice in, in New York as far as what you had to do and how you had to do it. And he was introduced to Roy Cohen. Now Roy Cohen, for some of you, you might uh, be aware, he was the general counsel in the Army versus McCarthy hearings in 1954. Roy Cohn was a very, very brilliant guy. He graduated Columbia Law School when he was 20 years old. And he had to wait a year before he could take the bar at 21. And then he started as an assistant U.S. attorney in AUSA in Manhattan. And he prosecuted, he was one of the prosecutors in the Julius and Ethel Rosenberg case, mm -hmm. spy case. And his cross-examination of Ethel Rosenberg's brother was very important to the jury and helped in convicting Julius and Ethel Rosenberg, and they were assassinated. After that, J. Edgar Hoover recommended uh, Roy Cohn to Joe McCarthy, Senator Joe McCarthy from Wisconsin. And at 24, he became his general counsel. And he was... Uh, a guy, at that point in his life, he was a young guy. He was a, maybe more of a liberal Democrat, came from a family yeah. where his father was a judge, and his great uncle owned Lionel Corporation, which made the Lionel trains. Oh, wow. So this was not a guy just off the street. Now, as, as general counsel for McCarthy, he was pushing McCarthy's themes, which was, of course, there's a communist in everybody's bed. And eventually, what had happened was uh, Roy Cohen, had one of his friends, a guy by the name of uh, George Shine, had come to work for him. And Shine got drafted by the military, the Army. The Army. And McCarthy and, McCarthy and Cohn both kept asking special favors for Shine, that he'd not be given overseas duty, that he'd be let out early from the Army. And uh, the government eventually sued Joe McCarthy about this. And that's where those hearings took place. And after the hearings, uh, Cohn left and went into private practice in New York. And that's where Donald Trump was introduced to him. And the best way to describe Roy Cohn is, I think, the way Alan Dershowitz, a longtime uh, professor of law at Harvard University, said he was the quintessential fixer. And that's really the truth. That's what Roy Cohn was. I met Roy Cohn once. He was a very obnoxious guy, to be honest with you. He was an abrasive guy, but he was a terrific lawyer. He had George Steinbrenner was his counsel. He had many celebrities that were his counsel. And he also had mob guys that were his counsel, too. He had Carmen Galanti, who was head of the Bonanno family. And he had John Gotti, who would eventually become head of the Gambino family. And he also had Anthony Fat Tony Salerno. <laughs> who was head of the Genovese family. I met Tony Salerno, we'll talk a little bit about that. And the reason the importance of knowing this was Cohn was able to teach Donald Trump how to navigate New York politics and the mob operation. Normally when a building is built in New York, it's a steel girded <coughs> building with ready cast uh, cement mix. And what happened was a lot of these companies had to ready mix cement. And these companies were fronts for mob operations. Thank you. And one of them was SNA, and that was a company that was owned by Tony Salerno and Paul Castellano. And Paul Castellano was head of the Gambino family. Paul Castellano, known as Big Paulie, was Carlo Gambino's brother in law. Excuse me. And as my father would say, Carlo Gambino died of natural causes. <laughs> my father used to say there's two types of causes that you die by. God's natural causes and mob's natural causes. <laughs> and in this case, Carlo Gambino died by God's natural causes, <laughs> not by the mobs. When Donald Trump was interested in, uh, was going to build Trump yeah, Tower, God, right? he, would, uh, he hired the company SNA concrete. And SNA was a front for Tony Salerno and Paul, Gant and Paul Castellano. 
I had met Tony Salerno in 1970. Tony Salerno was from what was known as East Harlem. That's a, the official title. It's in Manhattan. But it was known to the residents as an Italian Harlem from the 1920s and 1930s, and early 1940s, early 1950s. And eventually, uh, Puerto Ricans and black people moved in and became Spanish Harlem. And some of you might remember the song from the 1960s, There is a Rose in Spanish Harlem by Benny King, yeah. which was a popular, a favorite song of Robert Kennedy. Well, said it was one of, his, one of his favorites. The area that I'm talking about is only a six-block area. It's on Pleasant Avenue between 114th and 120th Street. And that was the heavy Italian area. There was also a heavy Genovese crime family area where future Genovese crime family members were born and raised. And Tony Salerno was born and raised in that area. And in 1970, I was with the guy, and he said, yeah, well, let's go up. To East Harlem. We had him up and see Tony Salerno. He said, you know who Tony Salerno is? I said, no, I got an idea, but I didn't know Tony Salerno at that point. I said, I knew he was a Genovese guy, but he wasn't headed of a family, at the, a Genovese crime family at that point. So as we're going up there, we get into East Harlem, and the area is a rough area as we're driving through. And then all of a sudden, we're like in the center part, on 114th between 120th Street and Pleasant Avenue. It's all Italians. Just this little six block area in, in this part of East Harlem is all Italians. So I asked the guy, he says, how these people are going to get along? And he looked at me, he said, when the Genovese family lives here, you can be out on the street 12 o'clock at night and no one's going to bother your sister. <laughs> so I go in to a boys and girls club, and this was the mob social club for the Genovese crime family. I meet Tony Salerno, and the first thing Tony Salerno said to me, and I was a little surprised, he says, your daddy is Mr. Las Vegas for the outfit, isn't he? And I said, yeah, yeah, he is. And Tony Salerno was talking to me, we were, and we were talking, and he, Tony Salerno was the type of guy that was not a flashy guy, he wasn't a club guy, he was the guy from 116th Street in East Harlem. But also there that day was another guy who became a cop or a boss in the Genovese family, who was from the neighborhood, Anthony Tony Ducks Corallo. And Tony Ducks Corallo he plays an important role here with Donald Trump because Tony Ducks Corallo was in charge. He had authorization and control of the building trade unions, which are very, very important for construction. So after reading Salerno, I could kind of get the picture of what was going on here. And I wasn't really surprised when I heard about, excuse me, heard about that Donald Trump had hired S&A construction company. Now they were the Ready Mix company. And Ready Mix concrete is cheaper than uh, the cast type that's used. But you also have to pour it very quickly. Otherwise it hardens up. So that means you have to take care of the unions, the cement drivers, and everyone who's bringing the cement, because that's got to go into your project right away. So. Now, Salerno, being a, a uh, was, was, you had, his lawyer was uh, you know, Roy Cohn, made it a lot easier for Donald Trump to get to know Salerno. And Salerno, as with all mobbed up construction companies, the invoices are marked up, I will tell you this from experience, usually 30%. Wow. And they're marked up 30% because you have to hire ghost payrollers. You gotta put ghosts on, on the payroll. You don't put ghosts on the payroll, your project's going nowhere, okay? And, and you as a developer, you've got maybe millions of dollars out on loan from a bank, and the bank doesn't care about whether your project's working or not, they're just gonna wanna get their interest. So it's either you play ball or you're gonna have a hard time with the banks, obviously, because your project's not moving. So, by having Roy Cohn as his lawyer, and Donald Trump often uses the phrase, we're, 
where's my right home? This was the main reason for that. And when they built uh, Trump Tower, the job cost eight and a half million dollars. That's what SNA got. And from that, uh, most people that when they looked at it, the job was really maybe a two million dollar job. Okay. So at that point, Donald Trump was using SNA for a lot of his projects. And he was also very friendly with this uh, business agent named John Cody, who was a Gambino guy. He was tied with the Gambino family. And what, what, what uh, Cody's responsibility was, he was a business agent for cement truck drivers and cement truck uh, union members. So Trump, uh, though he admitted, did, said he didn't do it, he gave Cody an apartment in Trump Towers. And he gave Cody's girlfriend an apartment in Trump Towers. And everyone was uh, kind of happy until Cody got indicted. <laughs> and that, that, that kind of you know, ended that. Now, a lot of the money that was paid to Tony Salerno was funneled to, to Anthony Tony Ducks Corallo. And I had met Corallo a few times. And Corallo was one of these guys. All he would say to you is, where's the money? 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 Bring me the money. Put it in my hand. I want it now. And he'd give you this, this look. Like if he didn't have the money, there was no reason we'd be talking. Maybe there was no reason that you shouldn't be in a trunk, as he told me one time with someone. And so with Mr. Corallo, you had to handle things very carefully. But the money was funneled up from Tony Salerno, who now is in charge of the, uh, the Genovese family, to Tony Ducks Corallo. And Tony Ducks Corallo was starting to have dinner with Donald Trump and his wife, Amanda. And Trump always uh, was, would tell the FBI later in an investigation, when they were investigating how Trump got uh, some property, he said that he never knew that these guys were involved with anything sinister. And if he knew, he certainly would have called the FBI <laughs> as quickly as possible and told them about these guys. And he would have helped the FBI as much as he could have. And the FBI agent looked at him like, yeah, you're even smoking something that's not a cigarette, Mr. Trump. <laughs> okay. They didn't believe him. You know, they knew what was going on. And, and, and this New York business was pretty much conducted that way, using my people as much as he could. Usually, developers in New York, they know they have to deal with mopped up companies, but they don't make it a practice to get very close to them. They don't want to get close to them. Because obviously, by getting close to them, when the FBI comes looking, they come knocking at your door, they want to know, how do you know this guy? They show you a picture of the guy. And if you say he's a business associate, in an FBI agent's eyes, that kind of lights up something. <laughs> yeah, that's okay? okay? And the FBI works this way. Once you let them in the door, and say to them, I have nothing to hide. And they'll say, oh, sure, we know you have nothing to hide. What's that up, up on the wall? What's that upstairs? Oh, no. And they, and they will go through your house, and before you know it, they're going to be looking at a lot of things in, you, in your life. So most guys in real estate, in construction, commercial construction, they did not want to associate with these guys. So they would hire whoever they had to hire, they pay who they had to pay. Trump, on the other hand, was, to me, this is my own opinion, is a wannabe. Not a could be, but a wannabe. Because these guys actually are smarter than him in a lot of areas. I'll be honest. With you. He's, he's not Mr. Brilliant. But they, he, you know, he, he liked being around mob guys. And I'll tell you from experience growing up in the life, obviously there were some people who enjoyed this because it gave them like a power trip, an ego trip. They felt some great, uh, like, man, I'm better than you because I got somebody that could put you in a trunk and make you listen to trunk music. You know, well, for a guy like Trump, obviously that led to a lot of investigations. And he was under quite a, quite a few investigations on things. But there never was enough real evidence to prove in his real estate deals and his real estate business. 
Now, when he got involved with the casino business, that becomes a different story. Yeah. Trump was one of these guys, and I heard from someone who kind of knew Trump pretty well, that really wanted to be a movie producer. <laughs> you know, that's what he really wanted to be. He wanted to produce movies. So maybe that's his presidency is as a movie to him. I don't know. You know, it might be. Uh, Probably what could have written a better you know, script. When, when he decided that he was going to build a casino, he had to buy some land. And the land that he bought in Atlantic City was near what eventually became Trump Plaza. It wasn't originally Trump Plaza, and I'll talk about that in a second. And it was a, a, a club called La Bistro. And La Bistro was a club that could not get a liquor license. So it didn't make much money. The reason it couldn't get a liquor license, there was two guys that owned it. I know both of these guys. One of them was Salvatore Testa, and one was Frank, Frank Narcusi, Jr. And they were both Philadelphia guys. And I knew a lot of Philadelphia Bronx guys. And they reported to Nicky Scarpo, who at that time was head of Philadelphia Mob. Very violent guy, extremely violent guy. I got along with the guy. I was just lucky, I suppose. Uh, how I met Nicky Scarpo was he couldn't get his car started. So uh, I, just, I helped him get the car started. We started talking, and the rest is that kind of history. <laughs> now, Testa and Narducci sold the property for about uh, about uh, a little over 1.1 million, which they probably, once they found out it was Trump, they would have gotten more. The problem with uh, both of them, they had some problems afterwards. Salvatore Testa was one of these guys who was a very, very hot-tempered guy, uh. extremely temperamental. You ask him about the weather, he's saying, what the hell are you asking me about the weather? You know, one of those type of guys. <laughs> and a year after he sold the land to Trump, got into a beef with Nicky Scarfo. Mm -hmm. Very bad idea. Very, very good. You never get in a beef with a cop. Okay, now that, that always reminds me of, there was a guy in Chicago, Ross Prio. A quick story about him from Stone Park. He also ran Rush Street. And a guy, one of the street crew members, went in to see him and said, Ross, you know, I've worked for you a while and I'm doing a good job. He says, yeah, you're doing a good job, yeah. And uh, can I get a raise? You know, I got a couple of kids. I got my wife's expecting a third child. Yeah. And Ross Priel says, sure, let me look into it. That was 1959, and they haven't, they haven't found the guy's body yet. Oh. <laughs> no. Ross Priel was not a guy you asked for a raise. And you have to be very careful when you're done with cops. And so Salvatore Testa was whacked. You know, he was found in a trunk in South Jersey. Now, the Philadelphia mob, besides Philadelphia, they were involved with South Jersey and Atlantic City, the rapids in Atlantic City and South Jersey. Now, Narducci. He was another case. Narducci was a shooter, okay? He was a contract killer for a filler. But Narducci was the type of guy that normal shooters, they do it on an empty stomach. They don't want to eat before they can whack somebody. Narducci was the type of guy, he would go out and he'd have the soup, the salad, and he's having the entree and the mashed potatoes and the green beans <laughs> and the chocolate pie, and then, you know, he'd go out and whack somebody. <laughs> Narducci got convicted of a murder and had to spend the rest of his life in prison. He died in prison and he lost a lot of weight, as you can imagine, because prison, eating bologna, you're not the, it's not the cuisine that you really enjoy. So that was it for Narducci. So now Trump has this land and he's, he's got Harris who's going to build a casino with him. It was actually called Harris Plaza on Atlantic City. And what happened there was Harris and Trump got into a beef, which I, I don't understand because Trump is the type of guy who I'm sure doesn't get into any beefs. <laughs> he got into a beef, and Trump bought them out for like seven, excuse me, seventy million dollars. Mm. and called it Trump Plaza. Now Trump Plaza was open a few weeks when I was in visiting, talking with a guy from South Jersey. He said, "You want to go to Atlantic City?" I said, "Yeah, we'll see Trump Plaza." He said, "Fine." I didn't know Donald Trump. I never met Donald Trump, and he wasn't there. But there was another guy there that I'd known somewhat. And he was in the casino. He comes, hi, Scott, how you doing? I'm looking. I don't really remember who the guy is, to be honest with you. He says, me, Bobby, Bobby Labuto. Oh, no, Bobby Labuto. Bobby Labuto was a horse breeder. He was a heavy gambler. and was tied with 
Gambino family, especially John Gadd, who's very close to John Gadd. <laughs> and I think uh, one of the things was at one of the racetracks, he <coughs> opened up a couple of the horses. And my only experience, I'll be honest with you, with horses, is that my father used to fix the last three races at Maywood Park and the last three races at Sportsman's. Huh. And that's about all I know about horse racing. Okay. The last three races, you could make money, and after that, you go home. And you only go for the last three races because they were fixed. Either the jockey was pulling the reins or they doped up the horse. But other than that, I don't know anything about horse racing. <laughs> so Laguno says to me, hey, Scott, how are you doing? I said, well, that's fine, Bob. How are you? How are you? Nice to see you. And like I said, he was a heavy, heavy gambler in the, the casino. He was a whale, what they call a whale. And uh, they gave him a special table and, you know, yeah. So I says to him, I says, he says, hey, you know, Donnie's not here. I says, Donnie who? He said, you know, Donnie Trump. I said, I don't know Donnie Trump. Or Donnie Brisk. You know? and, he, and he says to me, he says, yeah, well, you know, I mean, I'll introduce you. I said, yeah, it's great, Bob. It's okay, you know. Trump and, and Labuti were very close, very, very close. But Trump, in later years, Bob, Bob Labuto? Who, who's Bob Labuto? <laughs> Until a video appeared that he was at one of these uh, wrestling mania things that Trump threw at Trump Plaza, <laughs> and, and Labuto sitting right next to him. But I'll tell you another story how close he was with Labuto. Labuto had a daughter. Her married name is Kramer. It's Edith Kramer. And she was about 16, nice looking girl. She was 16. Trump was in his 40s. Oh my God. And Trump was interested in Edith. Oh Labuto, at that point. So I'd seen Bobby a couple weeks before. I'd seen that something was bothering him. I said, Bobby, what's, you know, what's, what's the problem? Something bothering you? Everything okay? You, you and the Gambinos? Okay, because I'm thinking, maybe you and the Gambinos got something going. What's the problem there? You and Gotti, okay? Not a no John guy. You know all about him. I know all about his brothers. I know his family. And I don't know him. I knew who he reported to, and he was Della Croce. But I didn't know I didn't know John Gotti person out there. He says, no, no, it's, it's, it's Donnie. Donnie's a problem. You know, Donnie's always a problem. You know, but that's nothing new. He says, no, no, he's got his eyes on Edith. On Edith. He called her Edith. His daughter Edith. He says, no, that, that's a problem. He says, yeah, that's a problem. I want to see him. So he, so he goes to New York. He goes to Trump Tower. And uh, security says, who are you? He says, I'm Bob Nabudo. I want to see Donald Trump. And he says, well, you're not on the list. Oh. And the Labudo says, guys like me are not on any list. You understand? <laughs> so they call upstairs, and Trump says, yeah, I have to come upstairs. It's Trump's office. It was in Trump Tower besides being, you know, living there. So Labudo goes upstairs. And I'm going to out. This is, I know, family-oriented place. <laughs> Wait a minute. So we'll keep this clean. And he tells Trump, I'm going to remove I'm going to remove your testicles from your leg if you don't stop looking at my daughter. And Trump said, hey, yeah, well, you know, that was just a passing, uh, you know, I just literally wasn't looking at her. I was just, like, glancing. I turned my head. And he says, no, he says, hey, you had your eyes on her. You were interested in her. And really, uh, he was, Trump was going to fly her to the Bahamas. That's what it was about. Oh. Okay? So Trump backed up because Labudo being Labudo, that would have happened. You know, uh, Trump uh, might have went through puberty at another point in his life. <laughs> so he backed off of the Budo. But uh, at that point, Trump was not making any money with that casino at all. He wasn't making any money. <laughs> so eventually, Trump Plaza did close up. He opened up another place. That closed, you know, too. But he's always had a history of mob involvement in a lot of his, not only businesses in New York, but also in his casinos. And he'd always, when people would ask him, the FBI would ask him, you know, so that was a long time ago, and I really don't know, and uh, I can't really remember. Kind of like the Richard uh, M. Daly defenses, I can't recall, I don't know what happened. They, uh, you know, maybe somebody else knows, maybe talk to my mother, my father, I don't know. <laughs> so, all right, so, you know, so that yeah, would happen there. But he picks up these phrases, and this is why I say he's a wannabe, because he talks, like, he tries to talk like a cop. He tries to talk about a rat, he talks about, you know, 
guys flipping and all that. But Donald Trump, from what I understand, from someone who knew both Tony, had Tony Solano and Tony Dux Corallo, told me that Donald Trump always had this scared look on his face whenever he's in their company. Which, having been in that company of many mob people, I could understand having a scared look on your face because they were scary guys. They weren't there, you know, they weren't your priest. This was not a confessional. This was it. So, uh, you know, it, it came to being that I always felt with a guy like him that he wanted to be what he couldn't be. And this is, you know, basically it. So I don't want to, you know, I can say we can get into a little bit more, but basically I tried to give you the highlights of this story of Donald Trump and what his life was with the mob. And Roy Cohn was very instrumental in being able to set things up with Tony Salerno to make sure that all of Trump's projects never had any stoppage. And that's unusual for New York because a lot of times contracts come up and there's union stoppage on a project. Chicago never really had that because it was a one-man rule, basically. You had the outfit, that was it. It wasn't five families. In New York, you have five families, and there's a lot of families that are involved with a lot of different unions. So you're dealing with a lot of different people and a lot of different personalities. But, you know, like I say, Chicago did not have that. So I'd like to move on to the next topic, and I'll answer questions about this because I want to get into the next topic that I'm going to talk about tonight because it's a little bit longer uh, than Trump. And this has to do with uh, JFK and the mob from the beginning. And the, and the point at the beginning is going to be before he announced as president of the United States, he's running for presidency of the United States. In March of 1958, I was nine years old. I was with my father, and uh, we had gone to see Sam, we had gone to see Sam G and Con in Oak Park, his home in Oak Park. Yeah. Now, one thing I'll always remember about the home in Oak Park was when you went and had, by the front door, you had a floor mat. Well, generally, when you were at people's houses, it would say, well, Sam G and Con said, go away. That's what that was. That was you looked down, go away. <laughs> So we're, I'm sitting there quiet, and I was a very shy child, very, very shy child, very quiet child. So I'm sitting there with my father, and they're talking about a few things, and then Sam Giancana starts saying, you know this Vegas stuff, it uh, looks good, it's, uh, yeah, it's looking good. And I want to own a casino. He said, I know I can't own a casino, but I want to own a casino, and I'll explain that. Sam Giancana was, skeptical of my father's plan for Las Vegas. Uh, he wasn't against it, but he was skeptical. But he didn't doubt my father because, uh, and this is a separate story, I'm not, obviously I'm not going into it. In 1947, my father was at a plan in developed for Sam Giancana, offshore gambling in Costa Rica, and then gambling in Iran. And so he was very familiar with, with gambling in that respect. And my father knew what went on in Havana with Mayor Ransky. But Sam Giancana was, at that point, skeptical. Uh, Paul Rico was, let's get more information. Tony Ricardo, nah, it's a flash in the pan, forget about it, we're not going to do it. But as the money started rolling in from the first casino, first casino was the Riviera. Now in 1959, the Stardust was coming online. And then the DI that was in. So things were starting to happen. The money started to come in. And my father, of course, had convinced Tony Accardo by telling him that the illegal money in Chicago, the gambling money, and all the illegal money they were making, would be money laundered in Las Vegas. And how was money laundered was you buy the chips, and then you cash the chips in, and you bring the money back clean. The money would come back clean. All the dirty money would come back clean. So Sam Giancana said that my father, I don't remember, I was listening, sitting there. He said, I talked with Frank. And he met Frank Sinatra. Oh. He said, I talk with Frank, and uh, come on, you got to get a casino. Now, Sam Giancana was in the Las Vegas Black Book. And what the Las Vegas Black Book, later in 1991, it was computerized, but what the Las Vegas Black Book was, that anybody who had organized crime background, let us say, or organized crime ties, 
maybe they eat too much pasta. I don't know what they <laughs> was thinking. Okay? If they put you in the black book, you could not, not only not own a casino, you couldn't walk into a casino. If you walked into a casino and you were caught, the casino would lose its license. That's how strict they were about that. So Sam Giancana, when he said, well, I want to own a casino, he was going to have to be a silent partner on a casino. So my father's listening, but there's no mention of where the casino is. Is it going to be in Las Vegas? Is it going to be someplace else? There was really no mention. So they, my father and Sam Giancana talked about some other mob activities, and uh, that was kind of the end of it. In August, of 1958, Sam Giancana tells my father, I want to meet with you, come to, come to the house. So I'm with him again, and we go past the same side and go away, you know, but my father says, come on, come in, you know, that type of thing. And uh, Sam Giancana says, my father, and I create news. Sam Giancana was not an enthusiastic guy, <laughs> I believe it. He was only enthusiastic when uh, there was money involved, if you mentioned Ghost McGuire, oh. then he was interested. Okay? Otherwise, you didn't see a smile too much on his face. I'm really not too sure what made him happy, but uh, I never wanted to ask him because he wasn't the guy you asked too many questions. So he says to my father, I got great news. So my father says, What's the great news? He wasn't getting married, which wouldn't, probably wasn't great news for him, but not that. He says, I talked with Frank and gave him some great information. My father said, what did Frank tell you? Now, Peter Lawford, I know Peter Lawford. Peter Lawford, every time you'd see him, I don't know if it was 10 in the morning, he had a drink in his hand. <laughs> he had a Bloody Mary. He was a pleasant guy, don't get me, but he always had a drink in his hand. I don't care, 10 in the morning, 10 at night, always. And Peter Lawford was one of these guys, what was on his lung was on his tongue. So if you wanted to tell him something, he became a radio. He broadcast it all over the place. You know. But what he, the information he gave Frank Sinatra was he was married to Patricia Kennedy. And Patricia Kennedy told him, says, Johnny, she referred to her brother as Johnny. He says, Johnny's going to announce for the presidency in February of 1959, after he wins the Senate race. He was up for re-election in the Senate in 1958. November of 58. He was a heavy favorite. The Republicans just put a name on the ballot, basically, and that was, you know, that was going to be it. So he's, so my father says, okay, what else is cooking here? Because we're looking to see, my father wants to see what else is going on. And uh, Sam G. kind of says, well, that's how we're going to get our casino. My father says, okay, what casino are you going to be getting? He says, Frank is going to buy a casino. I'll be partners with Frank, and we're each going to take out 200000 a year. Oh, God. And that was a lot of money in 1960. Oh, yeah. A lot of money. In fact, for some of those, some of you that can remember, two baseball players, both in the Hall of Fame, Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle, in 1962, they signed their first $100,000 a year contract. They're the first ball players to make 100000 a year. And Sam Jean kind of talking about 200,000 just on that. And Sam Jean kind of was a guy who made 100,000 a month on legal, illegal activities. So my father said, okay, well, where are you, where's the casino going to be? And Sam Jean kind of says, well, my friend's talking about Cal Neva. Now, this is the first time that Cal Neva has come up. Cal Neva was located on the California-Nevada border. It was uh, actually a ski resort in South Lake Tahoe. <laughs> now, right away my father, I could see my father's face, right away, you know, when he's telling him about Cal Neva. Now, Cal Neva was a place where the Hollywood celebrities would go if they wanted to ski. Frank had been up there many times, was very familiar. The owner of Cal Neva was a good friend of Joseph P. Kennedy, <coughs> the father. And Joseph P. Kennedy used to take the kids skiing to Cal Neva. So they were very familiar with Cal Neva. Now, the problem right away, I, my father later, what he would tell me later, the problem right away develops is it's a ski resort. Okay? And as a ski resort in, in that area, you get about 120 inches of snow a year, <laughs> which for a ski report is great, but it's not great for a casino because the area where they had cabins, this was not a hotel 
like a casino in a hotel. These were cabins, and they had an underground passage to the main building. And in the main building was a small casino. Not a big casino, a small casino. So my father's listening, and I, you know, I was listening to him. And my father says, well, what's Frank going to do? <laughs> he says, well, after Frank, after John, John gets elected, Frank is going to invite him to Palm Springs. And I've been to Palm Springs a lot of times in later years. To a place in Palm Springs for rest and for hour and hour, rest and relaxation. And he's going to talk to him about getting capital improvements for the Reno Airport, which is a very small airport, so larger planes could fly in. And the road was a two-lane highway, and he wanted to get it, make it a six-lane highway. Cool. So they were looking for really capital improvements to develop around the area so they could fly people in. My father's listening to this, and you know, he's thinking to himself, later he told me something, thinking to myself, the snow is, he got snow in Chicago, he got snow there, he just snowed in. He didn't even want to stay in cabins, he would tell me, you know, I would, I would listen. So what happened was, in November of 1958, John Kennedy got reelected to the Senate in Massachusetts. And then right after Thanksgiving, he went out to Palm Springs for R&R. &R. And Robert Kennedy came out the second week, a big phony guy, Robert Kennedy. I'll tell you about it, big phony guy. <laughs> Big guy. And Frank didn't start talking about Cal Neva. What he did was he brought out a lot of Hollywood stars. He had Sid Charisse come, he had Shirley MacLaine come, he had Julia Krauss come, and he had Mamie Van Doren come. It was, I met Mamie Van Doren, and that's, you know, he had Mamie Van Doren. But he also had somebody else come who was 18, about 18, 19 years old. She had been in a uh, Miss, I think, South Dakota project. Very, very nice person. Really, really nice South person. And was a nice person through her whole life. And eventually she, in later years, she became a, one of Johnny Carson's Wednesday night poker buddies. And she would be on the Tonight Show a lot. She was an actor, became an actress. And Frank had a 20 year affair with her. And she was a very nice person. My own opinion was, I think Frank made a mistake and should have married her. I think she would have married Frank. Maybe. And it was Angie Dickinson. Oh, Angie Dickinson. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, she wasn't happy with Burt Bacharach. Burt Bacharach was a switch hitter. I don't know how to explain what a switch hitter is. <laughs> I'm trying to keep it clean. It's a family place. we got wonderful people. And uh, Angie Dickinson was young and was looking for activity, let us say. And Frank, her and Frank had a 20 year relationship. She's a very nice person. I met her many times. And she was just a nice person as she was on television. That's how she was in real life, very friendly. And she's still alive today. She's 86 years old. Yeah, 86, 87. So he had all these celebrities come. All these women came because John Kennedy was, uh, you know, his nickname was Mattress Jack. <laughs> <laughs> this is why all these people were here. Okay. Now, the following week, Robert Kennedy comes out. And we have other people, you know, other celebrities come out. Other women come out. <laughs> But he's, Frank is saving the home run hitter, as he called her, for that for a Saturday. And he's starting to talk to the Kennedys about Cal Neva. Okay? And they're somewhat receptive to it. Uh, they knew the area because they'd gone there as little boys with their father would take them out. So they were well aware of Cal Neva. This was not any surprise to them. So that Saturday comes, and I had met this lady. I'll tell you, I met her in 1961, after she made the movie Bus Stop. <laughs> it's Marilyn Monroe. And she's supposed to come at 12 o'clock. She comes at 6 o'clock. <laughs> now, Frank was the type of guy, when he was with you, he was with you 100%. If Frank was here right now, and anyone, he said, Frank, I can't start my car. Here's the keys, take my car. Don't even worry about it. Take yeah. the keys, take uh, my car. That's how Frank was, if he was with you. If he was against you, it was 100% the other way. He'd say, he'd say, yeah, flatten your tires. Or, you know, I mean, that's how Frank was. When he was with you, he was with you. When he was against you, he was against you. Oh, he's hot. 
this is one half guy. So he takes Marilyn Monroe into another part, away from the Kennedys, and he's cursing her up. He's cursing her. Frank's giving her every curse word. Ever. <laughs> Everything that he can think, not only the curse words, but he's giving her all the, you know, her own, use them, but the various uh, Italian hand signs, let us say. <laughs> and uh, he's, he's getting warmed up. So, of course, they go back, and Frank controls himself, and, they go back and he introduces them. And the Kennedys didn't know Marilyn Monroe at that point. Robert Kennedy right away smitten by her. Now, Marilyn Monroe, I guess I met her, I was about 13. It was after the movie Bus Stop, and she made the movie Bus Stop. And uh, I asked my father, who had been in her company, not much more than I had been, obviously, I had seen her. And he said to me, Scott, I'll tell you, people think she's like a dipsy blonde type, blonde bombshell type, and all that. But he said, one thing you got to remember with Marilyn Monroe, she knew what she wanted, and she knew how to get what she wanted. So, now Robert Kennedy is interested in that, obviously. Things are going to develop there. But the Kennedys leave, and there's an agreement now between Frank and the Kennedys. And Frank is going to work in the campaign in Nevada. And the Kennedys ask Frank if his friends in Chicago, meaning Sam Giancana, the unions, are going to well, help. Because at that point, Illinois had 26 electoral votes. They were big. They were big. So Frank threw himself into the campaign in Nevada. In fact, there were times he would go door to door with volunteers. And people were surprised. Oh, you're Frank Sinatra. And he says, no, I'm just a campaigner. You know, that, that's how Frank would be. Yeah. He said, I'm Frank Sinatra. Well, can you sing? And so he'd sing. He sing. And he told me later, he says, for Vogue, you know, you do a lot of things. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so I mean, he'd sing a song, you know, Summer Wind or something. He'd throw something out there. And Sam Giancana, obviously, now, after talking with Frank, now knew that he had a good shot and becoming a, a silent partner in a casino. So, of course, it didn't take long to get the unions in line. The Kennedys, and the unions were pretty democratic. But there was something else going on, a, kind of a sidebar to this whole situation. I'll tell you about this. Just want to, it's a little sidebar to the story. My father knew the strongest, most powerful labor leader in Chicago. Some of you might recognize the name. He was head of Chicago's AFL-CIU, Bill Lee. And Bill Lee was a very, very powerful guy. And Richard J. would have any political activities. Bill, Bill Lee was always at the dais. And so my father is with my mother, and they're at a the Christmas party. And uh, Bill Lee says, can I talk with you? And my father says, yeah. And he didn't know exactly what my father did. He says, I know you know people, and I know the people you know they, uh, the letters start with a capital name, and they got a vowel at the end, and they, I know you know these people. <laughs> so my father says, you yeah, know, well, occasionally I know these people. So he takes him in another room, and he says to him, he says, the mayor's going to run for governor. My father looks at him and says, oh, okay. Now my father knows something. He knows something that Bill Lee doesn't even know. He knows something. And then my father says, well, uh, in February of 1959 was a mayoral election like you have right now. And he's, the reason he's announcing in June, because he figures he's going to get reelected, which he did. Won the Democratic primary, and then he won the uh, general election in April. And in May of 1959, he'd be sworn in, and the next month he was going to announce his candidacy for governor. Because he, in his heart, I guess, he always really wanted to be governor. His governor's head of the state. Even though he ran everything in Chicago, he ran everything in Cook County, he ran everything in the state. I mean, you couldn't run for any office. I don't care if you wanted to run for University of Illinois trustee. He slated you. So he did, did, did everything. Judges, and everybody. Right? Slated everybody. I remember when Frank Annunzio got slated. And, and Frank Annunzio told me, he says, yeah, he says, you know, I had to see daily and I couldn't run on my own. I know. Everyone knew that. But my father knew something more than Bill Lee knew. In the 1956 Democratic Convention, Richard J. had just become party chairman. He'd been elected mayor in 1955. And he was the first time that he was going as chairman of the party, leading the party of the convention. Well, there was two governors there, Mike D. LaSalle from Ohio, 
and G. Menon Williams, who was from Michigan. And Richard J. Daly started talking to them about a draft John Kennedy movement for vice president. Hmm. Instead of Estes Kefauver, it would have been Stevenson and Kennedy. This was Daly's thing, what he was interested in. Well, while G. Menon Williams went to see Joseph P. Kennedy, yeah. I'm in a meeting right now. I kind of expected you to call me earlier in the day. Tell, tell John Gowdy we'll get back to it. One more time. Hey, stop it. Idiot. Oh, he's better to call me tomorrow. So, <laughs> thanks. Okay, fine. John Gowdy says he wants to talk to you outside for a second. So. <laughs> hey. All right, so G. Menon Williams had gone to law school with uh, you know, John Kennedy and went to see Joseph P. Kennedy to tell him what this guy, Richard J. Daly from Chicago, a mayor from Chicago, has this idea about drafting John, the vice president, and Joseph P. Kennedy hits the roof, he hits the roof, he hits the wall, you name it, he's hitting it. He's, he couldn't be angrier. And Joseph P. Kennedy had quite a temper as it was. He says, okay, I'll take care of it. He calls up Richard J. Daly. And Daly goes upstairs with an aide. And he goes into Joseph P. Kennedy's suite, the big suite there. And Joseph P. Kennedy cursed the Daly out. <laughs> cursed him out. He called him a shanty Irishman. He called him anything he could think of. He let him have it. He says, why are you you're trying to align my son, who's going to run for the presidency, with that loser Stevenson. <laughs> and, and Daly had it taken. And Richard J. Daly, for those of you that remember Richard J. Daly, he didn't take too much from anybody. <laughs> yeah. He had it taken from Joseph P. Kennedy. And he just stood there and take it, took it. And the person who was in the room had told my father the story. So my father knew this. Okay. So when Bill Lee told him that he was running for president, he was already a little skeptical about this. Because in politics, Yesterday, you're my enemy. Today, you're my friend. And that's pretty much how it turned out. In 1959, John Kennedy announced for the presidency of the United States. On the very next day, Frank Sinatra's lawyer, Mickey Rose, filed papers to buy the county of a casino with the Nevada State Gaming Commission. And it takes a year, generally it takes a year, to get a license gaming license in Las Vegas. So this is why it was done. As soon as Kennedy announced, he was in the room. So now I know some of you are thinking, oh, what? Scott's telling us about Richard J. Daly. What's happening with him? Well, after the announcement, Joseph P. Kennedy makes a phone call to City Hall in Chicago and uh, speaks with Richard J. Couldn't be nicer. Couldn't be nicer. Telling him how, you know, my son needs your support, your strong organization. When he gets elected, whatever you want, you will get from him. Like a lamb chop with Richard J. So now Richard J's got to make a decision. Is he going to run for governor, or is he going to help Kennedy? Okay, now it's a tough decision. Because he's, you know, I mean, he's not a lot to win for governor. He's got to run the whole state. And uh, there's certain parts of the state that if you're from Chicago, they ain't too interested in you. That's right. <laughs> so he's got to make that decision. And he decides that he's going to stay as mayor, he gets reelected, he's going to help Kennedy. Okay? So my father knew this. So when Bill Lee told him, my father, you know, at that point he didn't know, obviously, the phone call that Joseph B. Kennedy was going to make after February 1959 announcement, but he knew that Joseph B. Kennedy was going to come back. And he also told me later, he said, I'm very dubious of the Kennedys supporting anything that Frank has said I was very, very dubious, he told me. He had no, he basically had no confidence that they would follow through, that they were just politicians, and they were using Frank. So, now Frank works hard in Las Vegas, very hard, like I say. And they're working hard in Chicago. And I always remember, we went, the week before, it was about a, the Sunday before the election, I think it was Galileo School that we go to, which is near uh, Peter Park, Sheridan Park, excuse me, on Taylor Street. 
and there's a big rally in the first ward. I think this is like the only time the first ward ever had a rally, to be honest with you. And in the first ward, everybody knew what you're supposed to do, and there's no question. So John DeArco Sr., who was the alderman, and also the ward committeeman, said DeArco was going to have to give up the seat the next year, because as a young man, he had a little problem. He got convicted of burglary. So he was a felon. Uh -huh. At that point, a felon couldn't be an alderman. I mean, they could be if they weren't caught. You know, he had any burglary, but that's another story. But uh, DeArco had to give it up. And the guy who took over, was named Donald Carrillo. And Donald Carrillo, in 1967, had to give up the seat, mainly because he was living in Wilmette. And, and that gave him an address on an empty lot on Lexington Avenue. And that's when Fred Rohde, who was a state senator, came back and ran in a special election. And I always remember Fred Rohde, you know, when you think about various campaigns, they have slogans. And Fred Rohde's slogan was, Vote for Rhodey, you won't get hurt. He <laughs> was to say, Fred Rhodey won. And no one got hurt. So we're now in, Gal we're now in Galileo School. And John Diarco is talking to the precinct captains and all the assistants. Sir, sir, excuse me. Trump here a so we're at Galileo School, and John DeArc was finished his conversation. And he said, I'd like to have Sam Giancana speak, say a few words about the candidacy of John Kennedy. So Sam Giancana, everyone get, he gets up, and they figure he's going to talk about John Kennedy, right? And Sam Giancana gets up and says, my name is Sam Giancana. You know who I am. You know what I do. Tuesday, you carry your precinct or else you're going to have to deal with me. Oh. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh. John DeArco gets up, and my father and I were in the wings. We're sitting in the wings, standing in the wings, I'm sorry. We were, we were in the crowd, we're in the wings. And John DeArco gets up to the podium and says, Sam, thank you for those inspiring words. <laughs> On that Tuesday, every precinct was carried the first ward. <laughs> I don't know how they did it, but they carried up, they carried up. And I remember the, 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 I remember the, the day before the election, my father said to me, he said at Graceland Cemetery, they're going to have buried, the lines are going to be very long at Graceland Cemetery. And he said at Rose Hill Cemetery, up till 6 p.m., which was closing time, he said probably some votes are going to come in after 6 p.m. from Rose Hill. The cemeteries are going to be very, very busy, and the precinct campus there are going to be really working hard. Well, as it turned out, John Kennedy carried Chicago by 400,000 votes, and Richard Nixon carried the rest of the state by 393, oh, uh -huh. and uh, Kennedy won by 7,000 votes. Oh, God. And uh, very close. And he won Ohio by 10,000 votes, which was also very close. And I think they had about 24 electoral votes. So now, Frank is in his glory. He's come to Chicago, and uh, saw him at this place, Giannetti's, and he's talking to my father, yes, my father, my sister, my mother's doing there. He says, this is great, everything's great. And I said, yeah, it's wonderful, congratulations, Frank. You know, you worked hard. I'm sure everything's gonna work out for you. My father, you know, later in the car is telling me nothing's gonna work out, you watch and see. And I said, why are you such a doom and gloom guy? <laughs> and he says, I always remember with politicians, what they tell you is not what they always do. <laughs> so that was a uh, you know, learning experience. You know, at that point. Now Frank is named to the, uh, you know, the committee for the inauguration. He's one of the co-chairs. He lines up all the stars and everything. So again, he's working real hard. And everything is going great, right? Kennedy cuts in, he gets sworn in. First week in February, Sam G. kind of says, uh, you know, calls up Frank and says, Frank, I think maybe it's time to give him a call you know, so we can get this project going. Calneva. Frank says, yeah, sure, you got, you got John Kennedy's private number. So he dials the private number, and the secretary answers, and he thought, you know, I, uh, someone from the switchboard, okay, we'll switch him right in. And she said, this is Robert Kennedy's office. I said, Robert Kennedy, he says, I'm trying to call, and he gives the number. Said, she says, yes, that's that number, Robert Kennedy's office. Uh -huh. So he says, Robert Kennedy. He says, well, I want to talk to him. He says, well, who's speaking? And this is Frank Sinatra. Oh, I'll give Mr. Kennedy the message. Oh. Okay? Gives Kennedy the message. A week goes by, two weeks go by, nothing's coming from Kennedy, okay? 
So now things are starting, you're starting to wonder a little bit what is going on. So about a month goes by, and Sam Giancana talks with Frank Sinatra. It's a little more than a talk, it's a little more forceful. And with Sam Giancana be forceful, you knew that you were either going to do what he's telling you you're going to do, or uh, you're going to have a very, very major problem. And he wasn't that way with Frank that he disliked Frank, but he, he wanted Frank to be more aggressive with it. So Frank says, yes, OK. So now Frank starts making more phone calls, and there's no response, no response. Sam Jean kind of calls up my father. He wants to see him. He says, there's no response. And my father says, I, well, you know, he's a new president. He's probably got a lot of things on his mind. What is he going to tell Sam Jean kind of He's ducking him, which he was. And uh, so at that point, things aren't looking real good for Cal Neva. <laughs> so Frank Sinatra comes up with this idea of introducing the Kennedys, John Kennedy, to Judith Exner. Judith yeah. Exner, and Judith Exner Campbell, who was a former girlfriend of Sam Jean Kennedy. So she starts, she goes there and sets something up with someone. And she's coming constantly, almost you know, like every other day to the White House. And I don't think they're, you know, talking about uh, world events at that point. <laughs> yeah. So now, but in the meantime, Robert Kennedy is trying to have an affair with Marilyn Monroe. And she's going along with it, but that's not who she's interested in. She's looking for the top dog. <laughs> she's not looking for Robert, Robert Kennedy. You know, he's up there, uh, the Attorney General. That's not who she wants. So they're supposed to meet at Cal Neva. So Sam Giancana decides he's going to bug the room, he's going to have cameras in there, he's going to catch Robert Kennedy, and they're going to get this Cal Nevo all straightened out because he's going to show Kennedy the tape. Kennedy don't show up. Marilyn Monroe showed up. Kennedy didn't show up. So now things are getting a little more excitable because now Robert Kennedy, in May of 1962, and I'll tell you this where I tell you guys a phony. In May of 1962, J. Edgar Hoover goes with a memo, a confidential memo, that he wants Robert Kennedy to sign as Attorney General. And what the memo is, is that he wants authorization. Now, normally you have to go to a judge for this. You've got to go to a federal judge. It's a show cause order. You have to show why you want this to be done. He wanted to wiretap Martin Luther King's phone, right. intercept his mail. Uh, also, all sorts of FBI surveillance on him and his wife, Coretta Scott King. And he said, and in the memo, it said that he was a known communist. Okay? Now, this memo has been kept by every FBI director since that time. Chris Ray, who's the current FBI director, has it right now. And the reason they kept it to show what you're not supposed to do. It's like a learning tool. And this is where Robert Kennedy, I'm going to tell you why he's a phony. So normally, if a guy comes to you like that, mm -hmm. comes to any of you, you're going to say, what is your proof that he's a communist member? Has he given money to the Communist Party? Has he spoken to the Communist Party? Does he have friends in the Communist Party? Give me some reason. <clears throat> Robert Kennedy asked for no reason. He signed off. Uh -huh. He signed the body. RF, RF Kennedy, the body. He signed it. So now, Hoover's putting all the surveillance on Martin Luther King. Now when John Kennedy runs for the Senate, I mean when Robert Kennedy runs for the Senate in 1964, he's campaigning in Harlem and unfortunately black people, they don't know what he's done. They think he's like some type of messiah. Oh, he's wonderful, this, that. I know people that think Robert Kennedy is like an idol for them. And the guy's the biggest phony out. Because he should have told Hoover, come back with proof. Okay? Come back with proof that he's a member of the Communist Party. Why do you want me to sign off? Because that's what a federal judge would do. And from that point on, the Justice Department made a decision that anything like that has to go through a federal judge. A federal judge has to sign on on any wiretaps, any surveillance, and you've got to show reasons why. You can't just say, he's a known this, he's a known that. You have to show proof of why you, it is a criminal activity, you've got to show it. So now, things are, like I say, Cal Neve are now at a very much of a standstill. Robert Kennedy, all of a sudden decides he's going to be the big crime fighter 
that he's going to bust them out. He's going to bust them out. Mm. And he starts to set up these strike forces. And uh, he, 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 he subpoenas a guy by the name of Joe Valachi. And Joe Valachi, this is like in 1962, he's from New York. He was a low level guy. I didn't, I heard about him. I didn't know him. When I got to New York, I heard about him. He was a low level guy. And they asked Joe Valachi a question. And he says, I'm taking that thing between four and six. And, 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 and Robert Kennett says, this thing between four and six? He said, that's five. He said, that's what I'm taking. <laughs> so Robert Kennedy's like, you know, looking at him and everything. But they're setting up these strike forces. And Robert Kennedy's idea was he was going to indict guys. He was going to get them to flip. And that they were going to go against higher up, higher mob guys, higher capitals. And all of a sudden, he was going to be some big crime buster. Okay? Well, that's not settling well at all with the Mob Crime Commission. Not at all. Calumny at this point is pretty much a dead issue. But not this issue about organized crime strike forces. Now, up to this point, J. Edgar Hoover was not big mob enforcer that go after the mob. He wasn't really interested in La Cosa Nostra. And one of the reasons, there's always this rumor, and I will never say, and I'm always saying it's a rumor, because no one has ever seen this. Sam Jean kind of told my father, and my father heard this from many, many people, but it's only a rumor, that Mayor Lansky had pictures of J. Edgar Hoover as a cross-dresser of Clyde Tolson, his deputy, <laughs> also a cross-dresser in a townhouse in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Now, Hoover lived with his mother, so, I mean, you couldn't subpoena his mother to ask his mother, well, what's your son? I'm, I'm like, but no one ever saw the pictures, but everyone said, Lansky has these pictures, that's why Hoover's not really going after the mob. So, I don't know if there was any truth to that, you know, or not, but Hoover did not care for this idea about strike forces and all because it seemed to be taken away from his authority for what was going on. Now, the Mob Commission was made up of the five families in New York, and also Chicago had a seat, Philadelphia had a seat, Cleveland had a seat, Detroit. I think there were 90 members. And from the mob standpoint, I'm not going to get into the Kennedy assassination, because you know, there's, you know, there's people who have their views, and there's different people. Uh, you know, Kennedy had a lot of enemies, but I'll just briefly tell you from the mob, Point, standpoint at that point. Sam Giancana was very hot because Cal Neva fell through pretty much at this point. It wasn't going to be revisited. And uh, like my father had said, there were politicians who just used them to get elected. And once they got elected, it's like, who are you? Like any politician, basically. Once they're in, there's no check on them until the election. Then they come looking for your vote and, uh, and they do a few things to get your vote constantly. So, the mob commission at that point, they gave the order. They gave the order for the hit on John Kennedy. Mm -hmm. Okay, they gave the order, and and the order was given to two people. Both of them I met, and the one a little more than the other was Carlo Marcello in New Orleans, who hated John Kennedy. He he just hated him because at that point, Governor Earl Long from the Long family used to bring Kennedy on the Bourbon Street. So he could meet uh, the ladies that worked on Bourbon Street. Marcelo didn't like this. He hated this. And the other guy was Santo Traficante from Florida, who was tied with the elf. And who later on, I met through Santo Traficante, I met Charles B.B. Rebozo, who was a friend of Nixon, let us say. Okay. So they were given the order. Now, what the involvement was, what happened, that becomes another story, obviously. Everyone has an opinion on what happened, and I would never say anyone is right or wrong. It's other things that happen. But from that point on, it was all out war. Now, also involved, and this is, I'll tell you briefly, was the Bay of Pigs. And the Bay of Pigs, when they wanted to do the Bay of Pigs, all of a sudden Sam Jane Connor gets a phone call. It's from Robert Kennedy asking if he could help him. <laughs> Bay of Pigs. So, so John, so Sam Jean kind of says, what about Cal Neva? And he says, what? What, what about Cal Neva? 
We will talk about that later. Is well, there was a guy, mob guy, a Chicago guy named Johnny Rosselli. Handsome Johnny was from the Capone area. And he had a lot of CIA ties. Johnny was one of these guys. He was in Los Angeles, he was in Las Vegas, he was in Cleveland. He was like Jimmy Fratian, the weasel, who really was a weasel. Same, you know, like a utility player, moving them all around. And he was very good friends with uh, Robert Mathlow. Robert Mathlow ran Sunrise Corporation, which was for Howard Hughes. Howard Hughes' corporation, he ran it. And uh, he had uh, involvement. Uh, Mayhew was a former FBI guy, but he worked for, basically worked for the CIA. He was a very anti-communist guy, and Roselli knew him. So Mayhew and, and Roselli, Roselli comes up with this idea, we're going to poison Fidel Castro. All right, I mean, maybe he thinks he's working on Grand Avenue or something, but this ain't a great idea. Because like my father says, how are they going to get the, they put the poison in the cake, and they're going to send it to Castro. Like, what are they going to do, FedEx it to him? He's gonna, really gonna, sometimes in the mob, they come up with things, I'll be honest with you, ladies and gentlemen. They made no sense to me, and I was there. So you can imagine this is an insult. People do look at it, right? They're going to be crazy. Well, I was crazy. So then they're arguing about what type of cake should be, a chocolate cake, should be a banana cake. You know, back and forth, Johnny Roselli, and Matthew Bowie, should be this, you know. So they finally decided to do a, a chocolate cake, chocolate frosting, white side of chocolate. And I'm not a baker, believe me, I don't know what you want. So anyways, they send, they send the cake. They tell Robert Kennedy they're sending the cake. They send the cake, and Castro, I think he got the flu, got sick. And they thought, well, he, he got the cake, and he ate the cake, and he's going to die. So then all of a sudden, he gets better. He's making a public appearance. I guess he never got the cake, never ate it. Whoever ate it, maybe they died. I don't know. If somebody died. They didn't die. So then they wanted to send guys from the Alpha to Havana to kill Castro. This is where the Bay of Pigs developed. And what happened was, the father was very, 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 very. He told Sam Giancana, it's your decision, you do what you want. But remember this. These guys won't have any air support. They might get in, but how are they going to get out? Where are they going to get out? There's not going to be no boat there. They're, they're going to all get killed. The eight guys will all get killed. And Sam Giancana, like I say, well, my, my father, they went way, 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 way back. He says, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Forget about it. So they did the bad pigs anyways. They said, see, I hate guys in there. They all got killed. All of them got killed. They never got the Castro. They all got killed. There was no air support. And this is why Alan Dulles was one of the guys who could have been involved in the Kennedy assassination sure. because he hated Kennedy from that point on. He held it against him. He lost CIA guys, CIA operative agents were killed, and he blamed Kennedy. John Kennedy. So, yeah. remember the day of the assassination because that was my birthday. It was a wonderful birthday, as you can imagine. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, you know, you walk in the house, I, was in, I mean, I was in high school, the biology teacher, Mr. Caskill, said the president got killed. And then when, when I'm thinking in my head, they probably killed the wrong Kennedy. They probably killed the wrong Kennedy. So I come home, I tell my father, well, what do you think? He looks at me, he says, they killed the wrong Kennedy. They should have killed Robert. Why did they kill John for? Robert was the guy we got the problem with. Screw John, you know. Probably killed the wrong one. In the 68, Robert Kennedy was killed, but I'll tell you something very briefly like that, and then I'll take any questions or whatever, you know, whatever you want to ask me. If I can't tell you, I'll take the fifth. But let me just tell you. <laughs> <laughs> or, or between four and six, like Joe Malachi. <laughs> <laughs> right. In 1968, this guy was a former Chicago cop. His name was Chris Cardi. And Chris Cardi, at that point, was involved overseeing the California operation. The Cal Los Angeles reported to Chicago. St. Louis reported to Chicago. Milwaukee reported to Chicago. Omaha, which I don't know, I've had my family in Omaha, I don't think they're killing cows or something. I don't know. <laughs> they reported to Chicago. Minneapolis reported to Chicago. Des Moines reported to Chicago. Los Angeles was always known as the Mickey Mouse Mafia. They couldn't get anything right. They never could get anything right. So Tony Accardo had a place in Indian Wells, uh, which is in the desert. Near Rancho Mirage, Palm Desert. It's a nice, nice area there. 
and uh, he put Chris Cardi in charge, who, like I say, was a former cop, who got fired from the police department because he and another guy named Albert Sarno, while they were on duty, were conducting loan sharking for Sam G. Oh my God. And Sam G. Stefano, mainly for Sam G. Stefano. While they were on duty, they put a jacket on, and they were in uniform, they had a car mark, car mark. And they were go. So Cardi, the day that Robert Kennedy got killed, Cardi is upstairs, as a, he's working as a waiter. Now there's a lot of shots that are fired besides the shot that killed Robert Kennedy. And downstairs, the driver, Chris Cardi's driver, was an old time Jersey guy, mob guy from Jersey. I met him once, his name was Frank Bompensero. Frankie Bomp was his name, Frankie Bomp, Frankie Bompensero. And he's the driver, and Cardi's upstairs. And there's a lot, of, uh, like I said, there's a lot of ballistics of other shots. And I asked my father, I said, do you think Chris Cardi was just firing shots to cover for Sirhan Sirhan? Did he know Sirhan Sirhan? Well, I said, well, that's always possible. I think my father might know a little more, but he wasn't going to tell his son at that point you know, too much. So whether there was a mob involved in the Kennedy, Robert Kennedy killing, I can't really say for sure. You know, I really could not say for sure. All I know is Chris Cardi was there other shots were fired. Now in 1972, Frankie Bob and basically got bombed and they found him with 16 bullets in a oh. San Diego telephone booth. So maybe he knew something that he shouldn't have known. And he, got, he got hit. That was the end of Frankie Bob and But that was pretty much what I could tell you about. You know, like I said, I don't want to get into the Kennedy assassination because that's there's a lot of theories about it. But I'm just telling you from, from the mob side, they were very hot at what was going on with Robert Kennedy and uh, the strike force. And they figured, obviously, you know what a strange thing is, ladies and gentlemen, is that Robert Kennedy never liked Lyndon Johnson. Yeah. He never he liked him at all. He wanted, he wanted Stuart Simon to be, to be the vice president. He couldn't stand Lyndon Johnson. He hated him. And that's why he sent him all over the world the first year. When he, you know, in 1961, he went all over. And Lyndon Johnson wound up becoming president of the United States. <laughs> and of course, he put in his own guy, you know, as attorney general. And the strike forces uh, disappeared. Uh -huh. They went away. No more strike. Now, they prosecuted mob guys. I'm not going to say they didn't, sure. But they didn't have the strike forces anymore. It's not the Chicago. That was the end of that. So, if they have any questions, I'll take any questions from you. Okay. Should we give them a moderator? All right. Yeah, Andy, if you want to moderate. Thank you very much. Much you want to moderate, Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's been okay. a privilege speaking to everybody. Thank you very All right. much. I'd like to ask if you know anything about the demolition of Bonwit Teller, which was the department store that was demolished before Trump had to build Trump, Trump Tower. I only heard a little bit about it. Okay. I only heard a little bit. Yeah, I heard it, that there was a Chicago lawyer that was involved with it. But to what the extent of someone had told me that there was eminent domain involved in there, and that it might have been Eddie Burke who was pushing it. But I can't. I won't say for sure. You, you know nothing about the strike with the workers, of the Polish workers. No, in no, that part I don't know. That part, I'm sorry, I don't know. I can't answer that part for you. But that, that's okay. Thank you. Um, who, uh, just, just go ahead and call on people and. I'll start, I'll start, I'll start with the lady here. You always got to take care of the ladies because they, they come to Rose and put it on your grave. So I think I need to do it. Thank you. Uh, um, just, I guess my biggest question is have you heard anything about the, the Jewish mafia, the, the Zionism being behind any of this? Or? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. As far as the Kennedy assassination, yes, mm -hmm. there were crime families in in Israel. Okay, mm -hmm. there were two major crime families in Israel, and yes, they were mad, and it had to do with uh, military spending. Okay, and Robert Kennedy wanted military spending cut, and which is very strange, because running for the U.S. Senate in New York, 25 percent of voters are Jewish, yeah. so it makes no sense to me why you'd want to do that. But at that point. I think what I had heard, and that, that is one of the groups, when I talk about Alan Dulles, I talk about the mob, Israel, people from Israel are also people that were angry. I'm not saying they had an involvement, 
Okay, but they were very, very angry at the administration at that point, and were when Nixon ran in 1968, they were very supportive of Nixon because Nixon was going to be very supportive of them with AWACS and other, and other things. And that also, uh, talking about 1968, is when Frank Sinatra became a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> and so did Sammy Davis Jr., which okay. uh, that's another story. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Yes, ma'am? Um, did you see, uh, do you by any chance watch democracy now? Because uh, she's been at... Um, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, do, you do you ever watch democracy now? No. Oh well, th this week she's been. That was in my life. That was democracy. Oh, right. she, she's been at she's been at uh, Park City, Utah, and she she has been a film festival. Oh, for yeah, oh, I know yeah. Sundance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, there was a movie there called Where Is My Roy Cohn? Yeah. And she spent a whole uh, a whole episode on it. I mean, the whole program. Well, that was also a, a play, a Broadway. Mm -hmm. Where's my it? Where's my Roy Cohn? And the Roy Cohn yeah. doesn't refer to Roy Cohn. It refers to it means where is my fixer? Yeah, that's what it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you have any insight as to why why did the Trump casinos fail? Well, the reason, the reason they failed was mainly because Donald Trump had decided that he wanted high rollers, and he built like 85 high rolling the suites for, for high rollers. It was basically, the, see, the gamblers that come to Atlantic City, unlike Las Vegas, are basically blue-collar people from New York, and Connecticut, upstate New York, from Jersey. And uh, some of these other casinos cater to them. And Donald Trump, in buying the uh, casinos, had a lot of bond issues that were issued to pay for all this. And as, as the interest rates changed on some of these bond issues, he was fa falling behind the eight ball mm -hmm. because he wasn't getting enough revenue out of Trump Plaza or the Taj Mahal, which he opened up in 1990. Same, same reason, same problem. Where did the mob hang out in Chicago? Where are they? Like the right Taylor here, Street? they're right here. Taylor <laughs> Street, uh, right here at Avenue. Uh, for real, where are they yes, hanging out? Yes, uh, um, it could be Taylor Street, I should be Taylor Street, Elmwood Park, Cicero. Cicero. Uh, the police station? <laughs> the police station. Bridgeport, Chinatown crew. Old Town. Also in the Old Town. Old Town. Stone Park. Yeah. I told you, the mobs are right here. I don't have to talk. They're right there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. They, were, they, were, they would be all over. Rush Street. Rush Street. They, they were in the, also, they were in the Heights, Chicago Heights. That was a big operation. Oh, yeah. Chicago Heights, their, their territory ran from Joliet and then the, back to the east side of Chicago, of Hegwish, Hammond, uh, East Chicago, and uh, there's another, another town right next to I need a That was all, of the yeah, and they were basically involved, chop shop operation. That was big for them. But the map was really sort of all over. Uh, they were in Lake County, they were on, on near north, they were on Rush Street, okay. They were on the north side, Lenny Patrick had his operation on the north side. But did the mob start off around Roosevelt and Ashley with the 42 game? Yeah, that because that, 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 that was Sam Jean County. That was 40 because that was the 42s was the name was taken from a casino on Taylor Street, really 42nd Street Casino uh, Cafe, and Sam Jean County was basically the leader. And that's where my father met Sam Jean County. Sam Jean County, Felix Alvarezio, Sam Di Stefano, these were all part of the 42s. And that's a, and what they were involved with stick-ups, robberies, and they became pretty prominent, and Al Capone decided he better roll them into his operation, and that's how the 42s got involved with the Capone operation. Good you had your hand up back there. Yeah, in uh, 1958, I believe it was, the uh, outfits plural held a major meeting at Appalachia. Yes, sir. And I've often wondered why would they have had all of the major organizations meeting in one place? Were they trying to tell the FBI, we're big enough, you're never going to be able to crack us uh, in two? Or was there something else going on? Because it seems awful stupid to have that many uh, major heads 
of an organization like that in one place where you know that the FBI and everyone else is going to be out there taking names and uh, looking for excuses to Thank arrest you. people. Well, these guys weren't always that smart, to be honest with you. Uh, basically, you got to remember, in mob life, they didn't flinch for anybody, whether it was the FBI, U.S. Attorney's Office, they didn't care about anybody. And the decision to, make, to be an Appalachian was really the Mob Crime Commission made that decision. Because that was property owned by Frank Costello on that property. And Sam Giancana was there, and he ran into the woods when these guys were coming. Mm -hmm. But like I say, these guys didn't always think things out. They didn't always plan things out. And sometimes my father had conflicts with them on that because they were only to hear and write now. We want to do it, we're going to do it. That was their attitude. <coughs> but it wasn't outside of Frank Costello owning the property. That's why they went to upstate New York. And there was a big raid you know, up there. There used to be a restaurant on the west side called Longdale Restaurant. And in the back, there was gambling all the time. Yeah. Korean. And the mob hang out Korean. at that restaurant. I think that restaurant it was owned by Red Dwarf. Oh, I think that was Red, Red Dorfman, you know, Alan Dorfman's father, owned that because the Red Dorfman had a lot of gambling places. Yeah, gambling in the back. And Lenny Patrick would hang out there. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, and but I think it was I think it was Red Dorfman who owned it because he was a big union guy and he also had a couple of restaurants in the back. They had slot machines and they had you know, some they had very good I'll take your word, that was before my time. No, that's an old year. You have a question. What is your dad's name? Dave. You know, you usually get a good Over there. Uh, another former Chicago uh, cop, Richard Kane, yes. was assassinated, and there's some word he was involved in the Kennedy assassination. Do you, can you say anything about that? Yeah, Richard Kane, his real name was Scarletta. Richard Scarletta. And that was, uh, he, his father's name was Kane, his mother's name was Scarletta. He, they used the name Kane. He was an investigator with Cook County. Okay. And he, and he, was, he was the investigator assigned to the case when Frank Schwiess killed his girlfriend in Dan Ryan Woods. And you can imagine where that case went. Now, Kane was very much involved with Sam Giancana. He used him quite a bit. And he was one of the guys on the payroll. And he was one of the guys that he always said, that there was never any proof that him and Charles Nicoletti were at the Texas Book Depository on a lower floor, that they were the ones that were the shooters. But there was never any proof of it. My father never believed it. There never was any proof of it. Kane's problem that happened on Taylor Street where he got killed. And I'll tell you who killed him. Before I get through, I'll tell you who killed him. He got into an argument with Marshall Caifano. Okay. And Marshall Caifano was a Tony Accardo favorite. Okay. Mainly because in 1959, Roger Tui had gotten out of prison. He'd been in prison 24 years. God. And Tui was part of the Dion O'Banion gang back in the 20s. And uh, he was an enemy of Tony Accardo because Tony Accardo was a bodyguard for Al Capone at that time. He was a shooter in the St. Valentine's Day Massacre. Tony Accardo was one of the shooters. And my father knew Dr. Schwimmer, the dentist, who used to play there. And he invited my father to come to Clark Street that day. And Sam Giancana says to my father, you're not going there. He says, my father was like 19. He said, I'm just going to play cards. He says, no, you're not going there. He says, it's going to get real hot in there. You're not going there. So he didn't go. And otherwise, I would have had a different father. <laughs> would have been a doctor, so I would have a different life. You know what I mean? But, uh, but Richard Kane was on Taylor Street, and he got into an argument with KFR. Now, KFR, now, concerning the Roger two were killing, my father had set up the shooters. And, and the shooters were Marshall KFR and Sam Tietz with Brief read, okay. Brief reminder, about five minutes more questions. We're going to start the rebuttals at 8. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm going to up. You just stop. No, you're not. We're, we're, we got just, five minutes. Yeah, we got five minutes for more questions. And, and so what happened was it was Tony Spilatro. A lot of people thought it was Harry Allen. It was Tony Spilatro who killed him on, on uh, Taylor Street. He went in to kill him. 
because he had gotten into an argument with Marshall Cayetano, and Kane went to Tony Accardo, and Accardo said, I'm back at Marshall. <coughs> and there's another story about that I can tell you later. Do <laughs> you have any information or any ideas about... Louder, Dave. Do you have any information or ideas about what happened to Jimmy Hoffa? Yes, I have right. My ideas, yes. Jimmy Hoffa was very close with my father. Because my father, when Jimmy Hoffa decided to run for his very first union position as secretary treasurer of his local, he didn't get any money. No one would give him any money. He was trying to raise money. My father got him money. My father met him through the Detroit got him money. So he was very close to my father. In fact, when Jimmy Hoffa became this president is speakers? of the Teamster Union, uh, yes. he called up my father. He would not talk to Paul Manica. He would not talk to Sam Jean Khan. He would not talk to Tony Accardo. He would talk to my father. And the only thing he asked my father, my father told him the plan for what he wanted to do, take the pension money out, you know, Teamster pension money, from the regular pension money, and health and welfare. Those were the two funds that the money was coming from. My father wanted to insure change? with insurance. Change. insurance Sam G. Connor would do it. So something happened. The, the funds were encumbered. No one ever lost any money. No one's medical bills didn't get paid. Everything was okay. The only thing he asked my father was, what's in it for the guys? And my father said, jobs. I got people that coming and eating now, so I got to make sure. His problem was that he promised, when he was released from Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, part of the release was he would not try to get the Teamster presidency back. Frank Fitzsimmons was president of the yeah. Teamster. Union, and he was a front for the mob, and they weren't going to give it up for Jimmy Hoffa. And Jimmy Hoffa, the first day he got home from Lewisburg, called my father and said, we'll talk once I get the, the control of the union again. <laughs> but I have some ideas about it. We have to get right here. Uh, <clears throat> a gentleman earlier talked about a place called the Wandale Street Restaurant on Roosevelt Road. Yeah. and. Uh, I happen to know that there was a man that worked for the Lawndale Street restaurant, and that uh, once he learned the business, he later opened up his own place right across the street called Puddies. <laughs> and uh, within about two years, it burned down. <laughs> I wondered if you I wonder why. I wondered if you knew anything about it. No, I'm sorry. I, I know many restaurants that have burned down, but I read <laughs> a little before my time. In the back there. Yes, sir. Uh, why did uh, why do why did organized crime and labor unions decide to uh, associate with each other? They're both from the mob. Why did they just? I don't understand why they worked with the labor unions. The mob joined the union. I'm talking to him. Well, hey, the reason being, sir, any anywhere where All the right. mob can make He's money. One full at a time. No, you don't, you don't have Charlie, to knock it off. Let's get on with the program, please. I know they, they've got to get going, so I'll, let me, I'll answer this question. Uh, anywhere where the mob can make money, they will get money. And they saw money in the unions. And what they did was they ran their own people for the union presidency of the locals, and they started within the locals. And once they got control of the locals, because I go with my father, because basically it was 5% every pay period is what they had to kick back to the mob. And, and what, uh, so the involvement was, once they got their own people in as president, vice president of the locals, secretary treasurer, then they were making the decisions. And, and the union people, unfortunately, had no say whatsoever what was going on with their money, where it was going, how it was being spent. And a couple of times, sir, I will tell you, this guy's inquired, and a couple of times they wound up listening to Trump music at O'Hare. <laughs> but that was their involvement in the union because they could make millions and millions of dollars. It was a good money maker. Labor racketeering was very, very common. And last question. Last Anybody else? Right here? Uh, last question for you. All, All right. right. Uh, do you have any sense of how Donald Trump went from his association with the New York Mafia to uh, Russian mobsters? <laughs> well, it was easy because of money. See, Donald Trump was, was pretty, I won't say broke, but, but because of his severe debts that he had incurred, he needed money. Yes. And he couldn't get money from banks here. It's like, sir, if, if you're a gambler, you're going to go to a loan shark because you're not going to get money from a bank. If you go walk into, like, say, a U.S. bank, you say, I want 10 Gs because I'm going to gamble on the Super Bowl tomorrow. <laughs> you know what they're going to tell you, sir? Um, this is 
not our business. Yeah. And, and Donald Trump was basically in the same situation because of the debt of all the bonds that had been issued. That he was, it was just a mountain and mountain of debt, and he had nowhere to go. That was really why I went to Deutsche Bank and all these other banks. He had nowhere to go. Just like a guy who's a gambler, he goes to a loan shark. That's where he goes. Do you know any particulars? Will Barrage. Well, we, I'm sorry, sir. I think we have, we're a little short on time. Right. We won't be able to answer that. Okay, we're we're going to cut it off now and go to rebuttal. Uh, that's, uh, we're over on the time. Deutsche Bank, uh, are they a laundry? Is yes. That, I mean, there's something going yes. on. Yes, in They're a laundry? What, I will tell you this. Anthony Kennedy, the uh, Supreme Court Justice, uh, no. his son was a major, major loan officer. Thank you, sweetheart. Trump the money. Oh. Give our speaker a hand for tonight. Yeah. Thank you so very much. Okay, this is the famous rebuttal period at the College of Complexes. So everybody would like you to rebuttal, raise your hand. We get a head count and find out how much time we need. Keep your hands up so I can get an accurate count. Don't everybody come up here afterwards with no hand up. One, two, three. Three up and Tim is four, five, six, seven, David, eight here, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Looks like uh, everybody get three minutes. We'll be keeping sharp time. So okay. the first, no. are you the first one? Yeah. Three minutes and we're going to, please remember, let's maintain order and let our speaker speak. All right. I just want to say I, I hope that some of you will watch the film uh, or, and or the Thank play you. Angels Thank in America you so much. because you got to love Roy Cohen. Uh, he was dead in the play and he was a ghost. Yeah. And um, there was a scene, you know, after so many people had died of AIDS, he was talking to God and he said, God, you've been accused of neglecting your children and you're guilty <laughs> but I will defend you he said I'll think of something I'll make something up and this has just always been one of my favorite lines in a play is Roy Cohen talking to God and saying he would defend him when he was guilty and he would just make something up <laughs> okay next speaker please that play was written before or after three minutes in America. Yeah. <laughs> three. Okay. Hi, uh, thank you very much. That was very entertaining or informative. Uh, my name is Ellen Corley. I um, love this place. Uh, I guess some of the questions I'd like to ask still hopefully get across are <clears throat> Order uh, Okay. Let the speaker speak. He's not listening. Yeah. Uh, it's all right. Okay, maybe somebody else can answer them. Hi. Yeah, I just wanted to get the questions to you. Uh, um, specifically, you know, just so many. Uh, I'm a researcher, and this is an area I research. One comment that my, I guess my big question is, how can we stop these guys? I think they've taken over our government. I tried to run for alderman uh, or mayor, and people were like, broke my windows, and, I, you know, it's, the corruption that in our country is horrible. And so I'm looking to get rid of them and people just say, no way. But it's, you know, you keep asking, thinking, how do you, you know, racketeering, nobody ever stopped them as a lawyer except for the, uh, you know, taxes. And I, why can't we use racketeering laws to get rid of Donald Trump, you know? Well, because the, the Justice Department's corrupt. And um, with people like Roy Cohn, uh, do you have an answer? Or? Yes, I'm just waiting for you to finish. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's that's a question. You know, at the end, I know you'll deal with questions too. Uh, but, you know, that's the big one. Um, also, I... Would you like me to respond now? Or yes, go ahead. ahead. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The Department of Justice... Mm -hmm. There goes a lot. It's from standing here. Excuse me. It's in the that's okay. Uh, the Department of Justice... After Richard Nixon resigned, they decided, we're going back, obviously, oh, 40, what, 40 years, 45 years, well, thank you very much, glad you're here, 45 years. They decided that a sitting president 
this is a policy matter. The sitting president cannot be indicted. Okay? Now, this is only a policy. It is not a law. It's never been tested in court, but it is a policy. And I believe you will see in the Mueller report when it is issued that it will, he will talk about impeachment, but he will abide by the Department of Justice policy that a sitting president cannot be indicted. That's why you see Donald Trump talking about pardons, talking about things, because he's sitting there and he's saying to himself, they're not going to indict me. But once he leaves office, the next day, if the statute of limitations has run out on a case, then he can be indicted. Wow. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right now, he can't be indicted. Okay, that, Ellen, your time seems, is up. Well, I, not really, because we Well, no, your, your time is right. up, because but, okay. your time is up. We got to keep moving with okay. other speakers. At some point, Please. I want somebody to hear uh, when they're, as they're coming up You're, about Giuliani all right. and whether the lawyers being corrupt. Maybe, maybe he'll protected. address it later on. But thank you. For two weeks. All right. Mm -hmm. All right, Sid Cohen. Yeah, actually, the mob is not that much different than uh, countries. For instance, they try to go in other countries, like the United States has always took over these countries in Latin America and now they're trying to overthrow uh, Venezuela. Well, that's, it's not that much different than the Mafia. Let's, let's look at um, Marshall Califano. He comes from Chicago and he goes to Hollywood to try to take over Hollywood. <laughs> so there's not much difference there. They're always looking for different markets in order to take over to enhance their profit margin. It's the same thing with the mafia. They look for other countries, other uh, other territories, like in Chicago here. The mob went into a lot of other cities to try to take over. In New York, they try to take over. And that's when they fight between each other, and they kill each other. And the same thing with governments. They go into other countries, and they kill each other, and try to take over the country. This, um, I forget his first name, Butler. He was Lieutenant General. Smedley. Huh? Smedley yes. Butler. He was Lieutenant General in the U.S. Uh, Marines. And what was his job? Was to take over Latin American countries for the, for the, Boston, for, for the Boston banks and other banks. And they tried to take over one after another. Same thing with the Mafia. They, they, in fact, the Mafia, I think, uh, more or less takes the same type of uh, structure in order to take over other countries. So it's, a, it's all for one thing, to make money. And they don't care anything about people. Just like the mob, they'll just kill you if you don't do what they say. The, the mafia does the same thing. It kills you if they don't do what they say. There was one, um, one man, I, know his, I knew his uh, wife, she had a store around the Maxwell Street area, and his last name was Adler, and what he done, he borrowed money from the Mafia in order to, up, in order to open up uh, a nightclub on Rush Street. So what happened, he wouldn't pay him back. So one day they found him in the sewer with a knife in his back. It's the same thing. Uh, for instance, Noriega didn't want to, uh, Panama didn't want to allow the United States to come in there as a base and over to overthrow the Sandinista government. So, so what happened to Noriega? He was put in prison. He's still in prison. Next. I want everybody to uh, imagine that I'm Marilyn Monroe. And I want you guys to sing along with me. Oh. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Ayn Rand. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> the gangster rapper uh, 50 Cent before he became successful in the early aughts for such hits as Up in the Club and Candy Shop, began selling drugs at the age of 12 years old, 
and he was arrested several times and was eventually shot nine times early on in his rap career. He said this of George W. Bush. He's incredible, a gangster. I want to meet George Bush, just shake his hand and tell him how much of me I see. As uh, Sid Cohen pointed out, the government is a gang, essentially. And organized crime uh, are the unlicensed competitors to the government's monopoly on force. Happy birthday, Ayn Rand. Thank you. Next. Just a couple questions that I uh, have here. Uh, our speaker did a fantastic job, uh, as he did before, and uh, I just have one question. Uh, in Chicago, at least, all of the mob seems to be, uh, you seem to have to have a vowel at the end of your name <laughs> in order to uh, go somewhere. And yet there was a time when, believe it or not, there was an Irish mob in Chicago. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm just wondering, what did we do wrong <laughs> that we no longer have one? We can't all become priests. We can't all get elected to office. Now, we, we, I, I got two grandsons. You know, they went into banking. <laughs> <laughs> They're probably as lousy at math as I am. But the, the, the truth of the matter is, the, the, the Irish uh, mob, if you will, was at one point very, very strong. And I'm wondering if our speaker might kind of give a rundown as to, you know, why our forefathers. Uh, are no longer in the mix uh, along that line. Uh, I'm not saying that I would like to be Patrick the Enforcer, but uh, I am saying that uh, I find it interesting that a group uh, as talented as we are as a group <laughs> no longer have representation You're the lawyer. in the outfit. <laughs> Thank you. All right. <laughs> Hello, thank you, Scott. Very good presentation. I'm glad I made it. Saw the last one on YouTube. Sorry I didn't get to come to that one in person. Um, I used to live in Little Italy growing up, and there's many personal stories, but uh, I won't dwell on them. I'll go for the big themes. Uh, my friend here is holding a poster about the drug war, and it's evil. The Libertarian Party opposes. Uh, another friend of ours in the audience helped give us that poster. This is from 1943, Memoirs of a Superfluous Man by Albert J. Nock, another sort of early libertarian thinker. I'll try and make it fast. The War of 1914 ended in an orgy of looting, as any rational being might have known it would, even if he had never heard of the secret treaties which predetermined this ending. It ended as all wars have ended and must end. Any pretense to the contrary is mere idleness. One can say for Bruce that he was no hypocrite, exuding repulsive slaver about mandates, reparations, and the like. He chucked his sword on the scales, saying, Vae victis, woe to the conquered, and that was that. Of all the predatory crew assembled at Versailles, the only one for whom I had a grain of respect was old Clemenceau. He was a robber and a brigand, but he never pretended to be anything else. And he was a robber in the grand style. His attitude towards his associates pleased me. He regarded Lloyd George Wilson, Orlando, and their attendant small fry from a lofty height of disdain, as one might imagine Jesse James or Dick Turpin regarding a gang of confidence men, area sneaks, porch climbers. He also took no pains to disguise his opinion of them, which delighted me. If you left your watch and pocketbook at home, you could do business with Clemenceau. He would not poison your rum and water or besmear your character, and all his cards were on the table. As highwaymen go, one has a good bit of respect for that sort. And a woman who wrote with him at a couple of magazines, first when he was editor and then later on when she was in charge, Suzanne La Follette, from her 1926 book, Concerning Women, I put this on a poster for the protest last year, wherever exploitation exists, it exists by means of a governmental organization. 
which its beneficiaries control and use to protect their privileges. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I hope to see the president, uh, you know, serving time for this. Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right, next. Hey, what's he talking? A man. Oh, yeah. was Okay, three minutes. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Caesar with the International Logic Party. At first, I'd like to say that I got to say, no offense to the uh, lecture, I was really bored by the whole thing because I really don't care about criminal stories um, and the mob. And it, it just does not entertain me, really. Um, what interests me is what kind of conditions uh, create those types of people and those types of uh, infrastructures, and how do we fix those situations um, to really under undermine the whole crime operation uh, by making them obsolete. That's what the International Logic Party does. And uh, with, three, uh, with me, I have uh, two wonderful uh, other members of the International Logic Party. And I just once again, I'd like to reiterate that we are going to be having a meeting to make democracy as convenient for you as possible um, by having a meeting here right before the meeting of the College of Complexes. So we have these flyers here um, with some uh, information about where our meetings are taking place and how the International Logic Party operates. Uh, we'll be distributing those, so uh, please uh, grab one if you'd like to know. Give us your uh, website for the web audience. The, for the web audience, it is Egora, that's spelled E G O R A dash I L P dot org. Egora dash I L P dot org. And maybe you guys want to throw in some. Uh, that's an invitation from me personally. I'd like for you to see how a real democracy operates. What time? Uh, five or four? Five p.m. Five p.m. One hour before. Okay. If, you, if you could throw in Rachel. Come. Uh -huh. <laughs> invite invite the, the nice um, people. You guys are invited to the International Logic Party meetings if you are want to come. We meet almost every day. <laughs> what does a meeting look like? What do we do in our meetings? Well, we actually set up our ideological profiles, which are 23 points. Like 23 is what we agree with like most, and like one would be like what we agree with least. And we can like look through other people's ideological profiles and choose which ideas we agree with, put in our profiles, or come up with another idea, and like just discuss ideas with each other in the meetings. Yes, and uh, based on which ideas are supported mo most strongly by the most people, those ideas rise up on the index. We will eventually be able to nominate political candidates who actually represent the ideas that uh, well that people represent. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank uh, you. So we got flyers. Um, yeah, join the logic. Okay, next. Use logic. Uh, can it one of the. Uh, so I've heard one of the uh, main antagonists of the Kennedy brothers was uh, our own leader of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, and um, I've heard many times uh, that uh, Hoover denied the existence of organized crime, and uh, if the speaker had a second during his final comments to uh, to maybe talk about if he knows of any connection with Hoover and organized crime and to explain that wacky comment. And thank you very much for your speech. <laughs> okay, Charlie. Three minutes, Charlie. I'll go. Somebody, you want me to? I'll go. All right, hurry up, Jonathan. Hurry up, All right, Jonathan. Somebody's got to hold this up for me, though. Here, you hold it up for me. I'll hold it up. All right. You have four? Okay. Thank you, Scott, for a great talk. Uh, one step forward, a hundred back. Two steps forward, a thousand traps. Three steps forward, millions in contracts. Really billions, but who's counting what fills up the under the table hats? One step forward, a hundred back. Two steps forward, a thousand traps. Three steps forward, billions in contracts. Really trillions, but who's checking the offshore havens of tax? No democracy equals no future dreams or equality roads. No democracy equals no accountability. We check our own. 
No democracy equals no future dreams or civil rights roads. Good while it lasted, that's not our goal. In 2016, this is very relevant to tonight's talk, so I appreciate Scott's hard work in uh, interviewing a lot of these folks to get it on record, what really goes on, not really behind the curtain, right in front of the curtain, and we just have to look clearly. Uh, 2016, there was a, a Rodolfo, Berrigan, Axel, Tilburg uh, study done at Stanford University about the primaries. And they found something out very interesting about American electoral politics. And of course, we're all very proud of we the people of the United States of America because we're the salt of the earth because uh, we've actually survived this corporatism over the decades. So you all are the Super Bowl champions of survival of fanatical unreasonableness. Uh, what happened was there was an exit poll for the primaries and then there was an actual vote count tally. And interesting enough, this Rodolfo Berrigan Stanford University report uh, proved that there was one in 77 billion chance, let me just repeat that, because I can't get my head around that number, there was one in 77 billion chance that the discrepancy was actually a legitimate thing. <laughs> so that means that even though the candidate that was leading had the votes to win legitimately, they still cheated. <laughs> And that echoes a lot of things that Scott brought to our attention tonight. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Uh, there's some websites you could go to for the Rodolfo Berrigan uh, report. I don't have time in my rebuttal, but come to me afterwards. I got all the websites written down because I did research for this in the first talk I gave. Uh, the reason why we have so much organized crime in the world, but especially in the United States, is because in the United States, the great ideas never are given a chance to be debated and enacted into law because corporate America hates great ideas. This is the Economic Bill of Rights proposed by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Number one, the right to a useful and remunerative job in industries of shops or farms or mines of the nation. Everybody needs a job. That's why we have so much crime in this country, because we don't have a government that realizes they are the last safety net for job creation when corporate America fails to create jobs. All right, your time is up. I thought I had four minutes. Three. Three. It's the right to earn enough to provide adequate food and clothing and recreation. He's, he's allowing me one minute grace period. The right of every family to a decent home. Okay, I don't have a home right now. I sleep on people's couches, so I really like Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Henry Wallace's suggestion. Okay. All right. The right to adequate medical care and an opportunity to achieve and enjoy good health. This is That's growing. single payer health care. The right to adequate protection from the economic fears of old age, sickness, accident, disability was implied but not said overtly, and unemployment. The right to a good education. Yeah. We don't need new ideas. We just need to remember our former elders, whether they be male or female, whether they be white or black, whether they be rich or poor, famous or unfamous. We already have You're the one ideas. With a we just need to this up. Thank you. Next speaker. Great speaker. He's, he, you don't have a right to speak at the college. Next speaker, please. David Travis, three minutes. Thank you. Uh, there uh, was a man named Wilhelm Reich who was a brilliant man. And he referred to people like Ron Emanuel and Ed Burke and so forth as Higgs, <laughs> which stood for hoodlums in government. <laughs> Uh, for anyone here who does not know the name Wilhelm Reich, uh, you might be very pleased to look him up. Thank you. <laughs> Next. All right, let's thank our speaker, Mr. Hoffman. Thank you very much. If you want to secure a copy of his book, which I highly recommend, if you go to the listing for this program in February, there's links uh, to Amazon where you can secure a copy. I'd also like to thank Karina for uh, helping out with our finances tonight. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I hope they didn't give you a hard time. This one thing he, I've heard briefly mentioned here regarding uh, agency policy, uh, the policy of a federal government agency that goes under different names. 
of agency orders, directives issued by a cabinet level officer or an agency chief if a civilian agency under the executive office. Those are written by the chief executive, usually have some escape clause in them. They are not, uh, as I use the expression, chiseled in stone. Those are simply guidance. And they are not rules. And they are not rules that the person issuing the rules necessarily has to follow, nor anyone else. Believe you me, I've spent many, many years reviewing agency orders and directives to see if they were in compliance with labor laws. That was part of my function. There are no big deal. And these are not laws. They are not anywhere near laws. And they really, I'm sorry, are like that merely a good idea. Now I must compliment my friends from the Libertarian Party of Chicago tonight, would for some reason find there's some sort of nexus or connection between the Treaty of Versailles in 1918, the War of Drugs, which was I guess in the 60s, 70s, 80s, uh, and I don't really, now, maybe you guys, I tell you what, why doesn't the Libertarian Party and the Logic Party get together? That might be a good idea here. Also, you guys were here, you're advocating the use of drugs. Uh, I believe there's an epidemic in progress. I don't know the figures, but you want to have, well, there's an epidemic of drugs. I also read today that 14% of automobile accidents where they've legal, legalized marijuana has been attributed to the use of marijuana. Yeah, well. You've got your experts, and I've got mine. I read that on it tonight. Now, the last thing, another thing I've heard is about the CIA, and I like my friend Sid. He's very intelligent, but I'll be honest with you, as a good lefty, over the years, it's amazing the number of things the CIA has done to ruin the lives of everyone on Earth. Your time's up, They're Charlie. They're responsible for all the evil in the world. I was going to talk about rights, but I'll leave that go. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Okay, next. Next. Yes. Our next rebutter. The Logic Party and the li Libertarians. A perfect place. I got you, Andy. Don't worry. Andy, I got you. Come on, man. Okay. Yeah, I'd like to mention a couple of things. Is the speaker working back there? Yeah, it's still working. Okay. Um, Tonight's speaker gave an excellent presentation of a part of history that is not always in the news. And um, I would like to point out one simple thing that something is catching up on us. Uh, a lot of us are interested in one segment of history or um, the history of transportation and uh, aviation in America, uh, the history of um, the Civil War. If we continue concentrating on all those things and don't take a time out like people did in World War II, people had all kinds of in different interests in 1941, but they came to the conclusion, they said the nation needs to take a time out. And that's what people took a time out from their college, from their jobs, people enlisted in the military, uh, women went to work in factories, the auto industry stopped making cars. If all of you didn't know that, the automotive industry took a time out for four years and they built, they tooled up and made billions of tons of all kinds of metal and everything else, everything that was needed to solve World War II, a four-year solution, massive mobilization. Other countries are calling for that right now. It's, it's a global consensus that's being blacked out by the press in the United States. And they're working with the pictures, the satellite pictures and the climate scientists have been admitting, the scientists have been admitting now that their computer projections were wrong. They've been wrong every year since 1990. When we first started hearing about global warming, they said, we're going to see changes by the year 2100, maybe a few things. And then they said, oh, uh, we won't see that until, you know, 2090, 2080. Well, in the last four weeks, satellite pictures have come out week by week by week 
of more and more ice melting and cubic miles of it faster and faster than what anybody dreamed and they said the one thing that they didn't factor in the equation was the warming ocean water. The ocean has absorbed 97 percent of global warming up until now and if the ocean warms up another half a degree then the, the Arctic is going to become ice free. In, not in our lifetime, these kids are risking their lives. Everybody else says, how can you uh, combat crime and everything else? Well, you put your life on the line. You say, I'm not going to go along with that anymore. That's uh, how we, we put an end to lynchings in the South in 1965. Well, this flyer, the last thing I'll say is this flyer that I handed out tonight gives you some websites and hashtags. Young people, 9, 10, 11, 15 years old, are walking out of school and risking their lives to aggravate the fossil fuel industry, saying you have to keep it in the ground and be happy with your billions, or we as kids have no future. That's what's going on, and uh, we're going to talk about that next week. All right, time's and up. Talk They're about it in two weeks. What, Charlie? They're risking their lives. Time's yes, up. they are. Uh, who's uh, our, 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 our speaker gets the last word? Oh, I'm going to take one, one, maybe two minutes. <laughs> okay, Tim's going to take a minute or two. And then I'll Not much. Up and get ready, uh, Mr. Speaker. Get out of school. It is to our speaker tonight. I highly recommend the book, <laughs> The Making of Donald Trump by David K. Johnson. I think it will drastically add to your repertoire of Donald Trump and the mob. One of the things he had talked about was that incident where he, uh, one of his helicopter companies uh, was ran by a drug dealer. Uh, his bandwidth teller demolition crew was a bunch of illegal Polish workers who actually wanted to lynch one of the foremen on site. Um, there was also several allegations by him that he doesn't really know how to run a casino business. And uh, one of the other things that uh, Donald Trump does is he's not very bright, but he does a good job in parody. His major, his major conclusions about Donald Trump were he is P.T. Barnum. So with that, let's welcome our speaker for the last word. like to cover there were a couple of questions I know Mr. Butler asked about what happened to the Irish gang and honestly the Irish became cops and the rest of the gangsters and they pretty much took them off the street as far as the question by the other gentleman concerning J. Edgar Hoover J. Edgar Hoover at the time in the late 50s pretty much and probably even a little bit earlier everything was about communism. And he really never believed that La Cosa Nostra was a big deal. His whole thrust was always communism. He had the agents working very diligently on uh, any areas of Communist Party, uh, infiltrations, much like right now the FBI, the bulk, the bulk of their budget has to do with protecting the country on terrorism. Uh, I'll give you an example about that. In, in New York, five families, there were always a certain number of FBI agents and assistant U.S. attorneys assigned to each family. And those numbers have been cut back. Okay, those FBI agents that were working for OC organized crime cases are now working any cases revolving around terrorism. And J. Edgar Hoover was the anti-communist fighter in the 50s. And he just never believed ever that organized crime was much to do about nothing, basically. And uh, it was a lot more than that, but his interest is not in there. Just like right now, if you were to talk to Christopher Ray, the FBI director, and you were to ask him, what's number one on your priority? Terrorism. 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 That's all, that's all they're really interested in. Sure, they're doing other things, don't get me wrong. But the main thrust of the budget, if you look at, the, at their budget, at least about 70% of the money is going for terrorism. And that's where the agents are. And that's what the agents, they're looking for agents with computer skills, 
they could work in these fields. So Hoover at that point, like I say, was an anti-communist guy. And the mood of the country was the communists were bad. You know, and Hoover was gonna defend the country. Now the only other thing I'm just backing up what Charles said. The Department of Justice policy concerning the indictment of a president is just a policy. Now, if the Attorney General wants to overrule that, he can do that. Obviously, if he did, Trump's lawyer, not Rudy Giuliani, because Rudy Giuliani, to me, is no longer a lawyer. No. I remember Rudy Giuliani when he, he was the U.S. Attorney for Southern District of New York. And this is not the same guy. Maybe he said, uh, went to a change of life. I don't know. <laughs> But Trump would obviously challenge it. But it's just a policy. It's not a law. It's never been challenged in court. It's just a policy that the Department of Justice follows. I don't think it's a great policy, but I'm not making the decision. Is there more of that book by Ken Johnson? David K. Johnson. Johnson. It's called The Making of Donald yeah, Trump. And, I, and the guy who ran the helicopter service was a top aide for I know who the guy was. I, okay. didn't know, I know who he was. Yeah, he was right. a drug dealer. Right? One more question. Yes, sir. Los Angeles or Patriots? Patriots. <laughs> or do you not want to comment? Uh, let's really see. New England is three, three, three and a half point favorites. Right? Right. right. So I think they're going to cover the spread. Okay. <laughs> yeah, especially, especially with the same umpiring crew, referee crew, New Orleans game. That's to get your money down on New England if that's the same thing. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. David K. Johnson, tell your boss tomorrow book. It's even worse than you think. Yep. He's on MSNBC. Politics and pros. Politics and pros. And he gave a little sound. Thank you. Very nice thing, everyone. Okay, that's it for the high college complexes. And to make an announcement, would you all uh, come to the tables, please, and move to the back. If you want to visit, you can visit uh, out outside, I mean, in the other part, because they have to clean this part as fast as they can. Okay. So, so move, move to the back or to the right out there, but get off of this area here, please, as fast as you all can. Thank you so much. We're adjourned.